This is Duke University. Madam S Assistant Secretary, Ambassador Duddy, Consul General Diaz de Leon, Consul Taylor, distinguished guests. Good morning, bonjour y buenos dias. I'm Jane Moss, Director of the Council for North American Studies, formerly the Center for Canadian Studies, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to Duke and to this international conference on NAFTA 20, the future of North American competitiveness. On behalf of my Associate Director, Amy vargas Tansi and our co-organizers, Ambassador Patrick Duddy of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, Gary Gireffi of the Center for Globalization, Governance, and Competitiveness, and Bertrand Guillotin and Samira Wellemeyer of the Fuqua International Programs Office, thank you all for being here. During this past year, numerous reports and conferences have taken stock of the impact of 20 years of trilateral trade under NAFTA. The goal of this conference is also to reflect on the successes and failures of NAFTA to explore how trilateral trade ties can be strengthened to make North American markets and supply chains more integrated and competitive in the global context, and to talk about North Carolina's economy and industry under NAFTA. Today, we're fortunate to have with us an impressive group of policymakers and academic experts, and you can find all the bios in the program. Before I turn the podium over to Ambassador Duddy, who will introduce our keynote speaker, I would like to thank the Canadian Consulate General in Atlanta and the Associate Dean for Daytime and MMS programs at the Fuqua School for their financial support. I'd also like to thank the Mexican Consulate General in Raleigh and the embassies of Canada and Mexico in Washington, D.C., and the U.S. Departments of State and Commerce for making possible the participation of their trade and economic experts. We also thank the academic experts from all three NAFTA nations, including three from Duke, who accepted our invitation to be here today. And I just have a few little logistics. Um, we will take some Q&A after um, uh, Roberta's comments, and uh, then we will begin the next panel as close to 9.30 as possible. And we'll take a coffee break um, between the first and second panels at 10.45 to 11.00. And then we will have lunch in the uh, Thomas Center. Um, evidently, Coach K's leadership um, meeting takes up all the space here. So we'll go over there. But we will uh, come back here for coffee and dessert before the government plenary at 1.45. And that's all. And now I will turn it over to Patrick Duddy and uh, hope that you all find the discussion stimulating and fruitful. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, and, and, and thanks, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, for being here with us. Um, uh, I won't speak uh, at, at, at length um, uh, about uh, Roberta's long and distinguished uh, service in the Department of State, uh, um, uh, but I, I did, uh, by way of uh, introduction, want to, uh, to, you know, to make a couple of points. Uh, Roberta and I have known each other for, I think, at least 15 years maybe longer than that. Um, uh, we, we actually went through uh, training to be deputy chiefs of mission um, some time ago uh, when I was heading toward, uh, heading to Bolivia and she to Peru. Um, uh, and I think that was almost 15 years ago, which is to say uh, um, uh, Roberta has uh, served at the policy making level in Washington now uh, for a very long time. She has been the director of the Office of Mexican Affairs, um, and as well as director of the Office of Canadian Affairs. Um, she served as deputy assistant secretary, um, and now, Roberta, is it five years or four and a half years as assistant secretary? It's three and a half. Three and a half. It just feels like uh, it. Um, <laughs> it is already a long uh, tenure as assistant secretary. Uh, um, and it is, uh, I think, evidence of the very high regard in which she is held um, uh, by the administration, um, as well as by uh, those in Congress and the department, um, uh, that she has, has been there to bridge the, um, uh, the change from one secretary uh, to another, um, and throughout this um, uh, hotly contested political season in the United States. 
Um, I, I would like to, uh, you know, to, to note that during her tenure, she's had to, um, to work um, often under uh, intense scrutiny from uh, the Hill and around the hemisphere um, as she's worked to manage problems um, uh, from, um, you know, if you will, issues, if you will, from the, from the Arctic to Tierra del Fuego. Um, the Assistant Secretary of State for the Western Hemisphere has an, has an immense uh, portfolio that um, in, includes participation in, in discussions and policy making at the highest level on everything from Arctic policy uh, to uh, drug enforcement, uh, uh, foreign assistance, disaster relief, um, uh, uh, international organizations within the hemisphere. And um, her tenure has seen uh, some uh, real challenges for the United States. Uh, and she has had to manage them in a context um, of uh, global complexity um, that is pretty much um, as um, uh, treacherous um, as any political moment we've seen for some years. And she has done it superbly um, uh, to the very high praise of um, her professional colleagues all over the hemisphere. Um, we're very fortunate to have her uh, with us here uh, at Duke today. Um, I've been trying to verify when we, that we last hosted an assistant secretary for the hemisphere. And if I'm not mistaken, it is um, several, um, at least, uh, assistant secretaries back. Um, uh, she may recall the tenure of um, another political colleague of ours, Otto Reich. Um, I, I believe um, he, uh, he visited Chapel Hill some years ago. Um, which was his alma mater. Um, um, uh, <clears throat> but, but I don't think he was here at Duke. So we feel very fortunate um, in having the assistant secretary with us. Um, and um, she'll, she'll chat for um, uh, a short time. Uh, and then I hope we'll be able to engage her in conversation. Um, I also hope that we'll be able to suss out um, some of those um, facts and factoids about, um, the, uh, um, about NAFTA and about our trilateral relationship, which will help us uh, better understand just why um, NAFTA in and of itself makes such a compelling case for hemispheric cooperation. So uh, thank you very much. And um, would you like to stand or sit, I think? I I'm going to beg your indulgence and stay here, if that's OK. And I'm going to probably mess up the taping a little bit. but. But after some hip surgery recently, it's going to be more comfortable for me, and I suspect for all of you, if I remain comfortable, if I stay here. And I think I'll be mic'd OK from here. Everybody can hear. Excellent. So th that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I, uh, I did admit last night um, that as compelling as everybody uh, that I met last night and that is here today in the audience is, it, it was kind of Patrick who got me down here. <laughs> Uh, to Duke because he was, A, very early to ask me to commit to, to this conference, and he was, as he is known to be, tenacious. Um, and and I, I should also say that, that I, I will be going to Chapel Hill as well today, so I will make sure that, that the next assistant secretary that comes to the area is, is a bit more even-handed <laughs> in their participation. Um, but I, I really appreciated it, and for me, the ability to come see Steve Kelly and Patrick Duddy and to meet some of the people here that I spoke with last night, to talk with Gil Merckx um, about our great love of Argentina, um, to hear from some of the participants in this conference um, is as great an opportunity as it is um, to listen as it is to speak. So I'm very grateful to, for that opportunity. And frankly, these days, I'm very grateful for almost any opportunity to get out of Washington, uh, especially to come to some place as beautiful as this. So, so thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Jane, very much for the opportunity. Um, and to all of those sponsors and supporters um, and centers that, that Jane thanked, I give you mine as well. Um, I sometimes open talks about the Western Hemisphere with, with two jokes. One is that I kid my, my fellow assistant secretaries. There are six regional assistant secretaries, by the way, five of whom are female right now. Um, there are six regional assistant secretaries, but if I have one hemisphere, why does it take five others to do the other half of the world? Um, 
I also sometimes talk about the Western Hemisphere as the Rodney Dangerfield of regions, um, which when I talk to young audiences, they sort of look at me blankly. Um, but it is sometimes the hemisphere that doesn't get much respect. Um, within the hemisphere, I think North America has, over the 20 years since NAFTA, been a little bit the Rodney Dangerfield within the hemisphere, not getting as much respect as it should. And so much of our attention these days is rightfully, I think, at times, focused on the threat, the crisis, the hair on fire of the moment, um, and the North American equities, the North American opportunities have, thank goodness, not been the threat or the crisis of the moment. Um, and so that sometimes, unfortunately, means that we don't pay as much attention to it as we should, or it doesn't get the, the front pages. Um, Colin Robertson, who's one of my favorite Canadian commentators, um, has recently noted that, that we, we need to show the world what good neighbors we are, and he talks about three democracies with 500 million people and showing the world what we can do. And I really like that, that phrase, three democracies with 500 million people and what we can achieve. And 20 years ago when we began NAFTA, I really do think it was a defining moment begun, obviously, with the bilateral trade agreement with Canada. Um, but it was a defining moment for the relationship among the three of us because it was so different, right? It was not just um, a free trade agreement. It was a way of relating to three countries and the inclusion of a developing country in that constellation uh, that was really very new, very different, and hard as it may be to believe in some ways now, very risky. Um, I started on the director's job in Mexican affairs just around the time of the 10th anniversary of NAFTA. And at that time, I distinctly remember we did not really use the word, the phrase North America, and we were almost banned from using the acronym, uh, let alone celebrating the 10th anniversary. And I think to some extent we can happily look at the 20th anniversary as quite different. We may not be using the acronym as much as some of us would like to celebrate NAFTA's achievement, but North America is very, very much present. It is, it is becoming, I think, more of a phrase in the news, and it is talked about as, again, being a leader in a lot of different areas, most particularly um, areas such as energy, integration, uh, and the next steps in NAFTA. And when I'm asked sort of what the next steps in North American integration and in NAFTA are, to some extent I think we have to focus on some of the things that go beyond North America, right? We have to look at the way we participate together in things like APEC and G20, and of course, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Because TPP and TTIP are logical outgrowths of what NAFTA wrought. When we move on to the next North American Leaders Summit uh, in 2015 in Canada, we will look back at what the leaders committed to in uh, Mexico last year, and we will look at how we can continue on that agenda uh, and partner in industries that are already completely integrated, whether we're talking about automotive or aerospace or electronics, and then we're gonna look at what more can be done. And we spout the statistics all the time about the way in which 40% of the value of products that we import from Mexico are from the United States, and 25% of those from Canada come from the United States versus the average of about 4% in the rest of the world. We know that increasingly, even in a United States that may not always look favorably on global trade during tougher economic times and the recession that the US is coming out of, the whole concept of North America is considerably less frightening psychologically than it used to be, right? There is no more US auto show, there is the North American auto show. The concept of North American integration is considerably less frightening to Americans than it used to be, and we have to be able to build on that. Just recently in Washington, there was the most recent 
uh, Regulatory Cooperation Council discussion between the U.S. and Canada. And for me, it was one of the first times that we were able to see um, movement and discussion more publicly of why these things matter. Some of you may remember a famous summit a couple years back in which Prime Minister Harper talked about the jelly beans, right? What can we do on regulatory cooperation that average Americans, Canadians, and Mexicans will understand, right? Why does it matter? And in an article in McLean's, in which the Canadian lead on this was discussing why it matters, he was talking about Campbell's soup and the way in which Campbell's soup no longer has to do different processes and labeling and the cost saving that they have had. Well, that's something people can understand, why it matters, why it is making industries and uh, businesses more efficient in North America. So we have to move on from where we were to look at the next level of integration. And obviously, I think one of the most exciting areas that we have to be looking at is energy. It's the 800-pound gorilla in the room every time the leaders get together, and happily it is an area where I think increasingly people want to talk about um, what we are doing on energy. Um, North America is clearly the area that uh, energy is a, a huge priority. You look at all of the studies um, that have been done about energy security, energy self-sufficiency, um, and ultimately, I think, importantly, energy integration, energy cooperation among the three countries in order to build uh, a system that really does work together among energy sectors, whether we're talking about fossil fuels or renewables. We already see projects uh, between uh, Mexico and the U.S., Baja California and California in terms of provision of electricity and cross-border grids. Obviously, the U.S. and Canada have been integrated in electricity provision for a very long time. Building that out as we build sustainable energy sources and increasingly provide for ourselves on energy is critical. But to some extent, one of the things that is important to me, looking beyond North America, as North America becomes more energy self-sufficient, I think most of the, um, some of the studies talk about energy security in North America by 2025, is what do we do next in this hemisphere for the parts of the hemisphere that are not energy self-sufficient and never will be? And this is one of the things the leaders talked about in Toluca. They talked about what do the North American countries do with the energy expertise and the growth that they're experiencing, especially, obviously, as Mexico's economic reforms go through. What do we do in the Caribbean, in Central America, to free those countries from single source energy or reliance on heavy crude, dirty energy, and ultimately what we've seen via Petro Caribe, energy used as a weapon against some of those countries. Um, and that is something that I think these leaders are gonna focus on very extensively in the coming uh, summit. Um, we have certainly seen situations in which um, countries have had those problems, really tie them in knots. It is really stymieing development in Central America. Countries in the region of Central America and the Caribbean are paying multiple times more for energy than are countries in North America or in parts of South America, and therefore some of the economic problems that we see result. And so North America has to go back not only in my view, to looking at its own problems and its own integration, but it has to go back to leading beginning in the hemisphere, right? What else can North America do to be a model for the hemisphere and its own behavior and to help countries of the hemisphere begin to gain that independence, gain that energy diversification that can promote the development in the uh, subregions uh, to free them from those constraints? Obviously, some of the initiatives that we're undertaking seek to respond to this, such as the Vice President's Caribbean Energy Security Initiative um, and the work that Mexico is doing, for example, with Guatemala and Central America, um, the work that we're all doing, all three of us are doing, 
with the countries of Central America and the Caribbean to try and overcome these problems. And we've seen it most directly, quite honestly, in last summer's crisis of unaccompanied children from Central America, many of whom were fleeing not just violence in their home countries, but lack of economic opportunity, lack of economic growth. So the, the nexus of economic constraints and lack of economic growth with the security dynamic is very direct, and so one that impacts North America very directly. Um, moving on just slightly to one of the other areas that the North American leaders looked at in Toluca and will continue to focus on, again, both for themselves and for leadership um, at, when we look at North America at 20 years since NAFTA. One of the other areas I think that has become paramount is education. It's clear that we all have challenges in education in terms of educating our own workforces for the 21st century and making sure that a North American workforce is one that is prepared to sort of confront the global challenges, to be mobile within North America, to work in all three environments as we are increasingly integrated in sectors of our workforces, but also that we can push an education agenda elsewhere again in the hemisphere. Um, it's something that we have done bilaterally very aggressively with Mexico, and it's certainly something that the President has promoted fairly aggressively, and I've put my propaganda on the table in the back, uh, in the 100,000 Strong in the Americas Exchange uh, Initiative. And it's again, it's something that we have taken for granted with our Canadian neighbors because there have been student exchanges, certainly, between the United States and Canada that have flown rather naturally without us having to do very much about them. But I think that we both know that we have more to offer in the rest of the region in terms of encouraging that kind of educational flow um, that, than we have done thus far. Um, and we hope to do more with that, doing more with our bilateral forum with Mexico, FOBESI on higher education, and seeing how we can integrate some of those institutions and make them trilateral or include Canada in some of the efforts that we're making. Um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about that actually sort of focuses on North America in the hemisphere and frankly beyond um, is, is what's going on in the hemisphere and what I would call sort of backward steps on democracy. Um, everybody that, had, that has <clears throat> looked at Venezuela in recent years, I think, is dismayed at, at what we've seen, both economically and in threats to democracy. There is a, I think, well understood, if not redressed, um, focus on threats to journalists and media outlets in many countries in the hemisphere. We saw a rather aggressive and concerted push against the inter-American human rights system, one of the best in the world. Uh, and one that was way out ahead, in fact, of some others in other regions of the world. Um, something that we all hoped, I think, with the return to democracy of recent years and rather consistent elections was past us in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, but it's clearly not, and I think upcoming meetings in general need to be need to be used as mirrors that we hold in front of all of us all of us in the region as to how we are fulfilling our commitments on democracy. It strikes me that North America, again, has a role to play in demonstrating um, vibrant democracies with vibrant civil societies and media in which not that there are no problems. We have seen lots of problems in the United States and in our neighbors over the past year or more but in which they are dealt with in open and transparent and democratic manners. And I think the ability of the North American countries to form a caucus on some of those democracy and human rights issues is going to be crucial in the coming year, especially as we look towards election of a new Secretary General in the OAS. Um, finally, I would say that um, we have to, there's, there's actually two more things I want to say. I apologize. This is longer than I realized, but I'll, I'll wrap up real quick. Um, one of the things that we in the North American context also need to try and remember is in our zeal 
for the large. We are large countries. We form a very large um, block. It's hard to use that phrase or caucus. Um, we have to be careful not to overlook the small. Um, and when I talk about that, I mean things like small businesses and our focus on job creation through small businesses, our focus on women entrepreneurs, which we do throughout the hemisphere, but sometimes lose focus on in our own, in our own countries, um, and things like education, working with universities, colleges, et cetera. So I tend to think of those as the initiatives that focus on the micro, and we need to be sure not to lose focus on those as we look at you know, very large companies and whole sectors, et cetera, because I think those are crucial in maintaining the competitiveness and sort of ensuring that um, we make sure everyone is part of whatever our achievements and our growth is. Um, the final thing I would say is um, borders. Um, and I know that others are going to talk a little bit more about this later and border infrastructure. Um, we all know, the experts in this room, that we are behind badly on our infrastructure at the borders. There have been you know, dozens of studies written on our infrastructure deficit. I think it was exciting that you know, in the last week or two, we've had the opening of new crossing at um, Mariposa and Nogales. Um, we've had some expansion of lanes uh, that was long planned in um, uh, San Isidro in California. Um, there are upgrades that are going on elsewhere, but fundamentally we are still way behind in our infrastructure. Obviously, uh, Detroit, um, we're finally going to be moving ahead, but, but there is no doubt um, that we should have found resolution to that issue, including in the United States uh, on the, the new bridge in, uh, in Detroit um, far sooner than we did. And so I think we know that we still have a lot more to do uh, to take full advantage of the proximity, which is our greatest benefit. Um, and so I think we need to continue to sort of hype uh, the fact that things are working better and we are making progress and the commitment the presidents and the prime minister made towards unifying our trusted traveler programs and making things more efficient is moving ahead. Um, but we really dare not take our foot off the accelerator there because we know how far behind we are. Um, and there's a lot more that we need to do uh, to exploit the natural advantages that we have. Um, so it is not that that's been forgotten. It, it is something still very much in the nuts and bolts of the relationship that we have to do. So I sort of end where I began in a sense, which is perfecting the, the, the relationship among the three of us and within our own union, if you will, um, and then also leading and providing that model for the rest of the hemisphere and beyond. Um, and I can almost hear Bob Pastor from above um, probably yelling in my ear that it's still too incremental. Uh, but I hope he would be pleased that North America is coming back into fashion, including in US policymaking circles, um, and that we will try and do him proud in the future. So thank you very much. Is this mic on as well? It is, great. Um, um, thank you so much, Roberta. It really is, it's a pleasure to have you here. It's an honor for all of us. Um, and uh, it's, it's also, I, I think, a very special opportunity for us now to, uh, to ask some questions. So I'd like to, uh, we can do this pretty informally, I think, folks. Um, but what I would ask, uh, we have a microphone. Um, if you'll uh, put your hand, we have two microphones. Wow, and one of them, one of them's red. Uh, um, there's no political connotation uh, to that. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, what, what we would ask you to do is um, uh, to identify yourself and your affiliation um, when, uh, when you ask your question. Uh, thanks. I'm Steve Kelly. I'm a professor here at uh, Sanford. Uh, thank you very much for your remarks this morning. Uh, one of the things when people talk about NAFTA, they mention the dramatic growth in trade in goods that it has facilitated, and also the investment flows. Uh, NAFTA had very modest goals for increasing the movement of people across the boundary. They created 
a category of TN visas, which are very severely underutilized. Do you see any prospect in the future for liberalizing the flow of labor between the North American countries? I do. I actually do. Um, and I do despite the incredibly frustrating debate on immigration reform, which deals with a part of that, right? Because it would also deal with certain other visa categories than just um, uh, low-skilled wage uh, labor, et cetera. But I, I, I am extremely optimistic about that, in part because even the discussion at the last North American Leaders Summit on the Trusted Traveler Program and unifying those was the beginning of that actual discussion among leaders about sort of improving the ability of people who travel in the three countries to do so more easily. It, it was one of the first labor mobility discussions that I heard. And even though it wasn't directly what you're talking about, it was the beginning of that conversation, whereas previously it was sort of like, you know, don't go there. In addition, of course, honestly, one of the things that has always been difficult about that conversation has been the, the immigration reform issue and the, the question of whether you could expand the TN categories or, or reopen that, that issue and not get yourself engaged in what is fundamentally the immigration, the comprehensive immigration reform debate. And, and it seems to me that as you recognize, and, and people should, I'm not sure they do yet, that we have been at net zero immigration from Mexico for the last two years, you begin to be able to have a, a better conversation about expanding that, um, those categories and the fluidity of, of labor. So I'm, ho I'm hopeful that that can be discussed in the future. Now, now I will say that this summer's crisis on the unaccompanied children, and, and let's be clear that it wasn't just unaccompanied children that came from Central America. It was mothers with children in addition to those unaccompanied children, and it was adults who came. And no matter how well Mexico is doing and our flow of labor from Mexico and, and among the three countries may do, if things do not improve in Central America, that affects that perception in the United States of whether we can have a better conversation about the three countries. So I think it, it is, in fact, incumbent on all of us to focus also on Central America, because otherwise Mexico, frankly, gets squeezed in that debate um, as the geographic, you know, pass-through, um, and, and under enormous pressure during that. And I think Mexico, frankly, it performed extraordinarily well under under very difficult circumstances during that period. It, it's a it's a really tough tough policy issue, but I, I actually am fairly optimistic that that conversation is coming um, in, in a very in a more coherent way pretty soon. <clears throat> Gil Merce, Director of the International Center here at Duke. I'd like to follow up on your last point and ask you whether you think in the very long run, obviously not in the short run, but in the very long run, that Central America and the Caribbean should be part of the North American uh, free trade area. Mm -hmm. uh, those countries look north. They don't look south mm -hmm. except for Venezuelan oil. But they, they all look north. Their migration is north. Their investment comes from north. Their markets are in the north. And so I'm wondering if, if this really isn't the greater North America should include those two uh, regions. It's a great question, I think. And I, I think you're absolutely right in terms of, you know, sort of where they look in terms of natural markets and, and certainly migration. Um, you know, it's interesting to me because we, we had an outreach from a country, which I'm not going to name, uh, not too long ago, which it was a Central American country, and, and basically what they said was, look, we, we are fundamentally prepared to kind of hitch our wagon to the North American star. We, we want to, to integrate with you guys more and make that commitment. And, and what was interesting about the conversation was it was economic and trade and commercial, 
But it was really more than that. It was, it was, it was we, we've made, we're making a bet on the future, right? And, and our future is, is with you guys, with the three countries of North America. And so, and, and I will have to say that I'm not sure we took full advantage of that, um, as policymakers sometimes don't. Um, but I think the answer is, Probably yes, if we are smart about this, we continue to encourage that. It seems to me Mexico is doing that in its increasing work with Guatemala on energy, especially, and Mexico has talked for a long time, and, and words matter in this area, about Mesoamerica, right? Uh, Mesoamerica being a a concept that includes more than just, you know, Mexico, but it, it includes, you know, Central America down to Colombia. Um, both Colombia and Mexico have keen interests in how Central America does, and I think Mexico, for example, this past year hosted the Association of Caribbean States, and hosted it with a I think with a sort of a, uh, an enthusiasm that perhaps hadn't been shown in a while. So I, I think that's really a very natural um, assertion of interest, not as sort of uh, one block against the other, but it is where, where countries look. Now I will say that in the case of the Caribbean, I think there have been times over the last number of years when, when we have not engaged as, as well and as broadly and as aggressively as we should. Um, you know, there are countries in the hemisphere which have said, look, we're, we're getting X amount of our energy and perhaps more importantly, X financing from Petrocaribe and we would like to diversify our energy we would like to have other sources for short-term financing, but you're not really offering an alternative. And the U is not necessarily just the United States, it's the MDBs, it's you know others. So I think we, and if you've seen the, um, the Atlantic Council's report on, on Petro Caribe and the Caribbean, Dave Goldwyn did it, it's really quite good. So this is part of why the, the Vice President's Caribbean energy strategy, I think, you know, is, is the beginning of, of a, a response because it's, in the end, what, what Petro Caribe offers is as important on the financing side as it is on the oil side, but in the end, they have to, those countries have to develop the regulatory structure, the legal structure, to diversify their energy source, otherwise, it's not, they never get out of this cycle, right? It's, it's, it's not a good place for them to be, whether it's for climate change purposes, right? They're, they're dependent on heavy, dirty oil, or whether it's the single source issue of, of a power relationship that's not helpful. Um, when President Obama was in the region last year and the vice president, the only thing they heard about from some leaders was you got to start exporting gas. 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 And that was including from countries that don't yet have the capability to import gas or use it. So, yes, is the short answer. I had I said a very long way around it. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, fantastic presentation. My name is Miguel Rojas. I, I work for CLACS, the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is, Thank you for that positivist view on something that could happen uh, regarding uh, migration. The question will be, what do you see coming from the administration? Because we know that uh, on the legislature side, nothing's going to happen in the near future. And we were waiting for something, but of course, now we are in midterms. And if you see something coming close uh, to the end of the year, or uh, uh, and what could be uh, what we are seeing on that regard. And the second question is, uh, 
because we have you here, and it's really hard to have uh, people with this knowledge about the hemisphere uh, at Duke. Uh, if you could give us a little bit of sense of uh, these other free trade agreements that are going on, have mm -hmm. been signed in the region, that are uh, pursuing you know, uh, further ways of integration in many ways. Uh, uh, Peru, uh, uh, Colombia recently, mm. uh, Central American countries, vis-a-vis -vis these other groupings of countries uh, that somehow are trying to create a certain, uh, you said something of, uh, of uh, problematic uh, views on these multinational organizations like the Organization right. of American right. States and, and, or the Inter-American, uh, right, ALBA or the, the Pacific Alliance vis-a-vis -vis the Trans-Pacific <laughs> uh, partnership, uh, things like that. Just a little bit of, of mm -hmm. larger hemispheric sure. views. Thank you very much, Matt. Sure, thank you. Um, on, on immigration, there's, there's not that much, uh, on the comprehensive immigration reform, there's not that much I can add beyond the president. I've learned over time it's always safe to quote the president, um, no matter what he says. Uh, and he's been pretty clear um, that, you know, post November 4th, he is hoping to move on this issue. Um, I think it's also pretty clear where he wants to move. I mean, when he's talked about comprehensive immigration reform, he has taken as his point of reference the Senate bill. So I think that's, that's pretty clear. Um, he's pretty clear also on the fact that what ends up coming out um, isn't likely to be exactly the same as the Senate bill, um, but, but the imperative to move on this issue just gets stronger. Um, and whether he will have to take further executive actions or Congress will act in lame duck or in new Congress is unclear to me, but the reasons for acting just get stronger um, and, you know, I just, I think that, that some forms of action pretty quickly will be coming. Let me, let me leave it at that. Um, on the trade issues, I think it's really interesting what's been going on, um, starting, for example, with the Pacific Alliance. I mean, I, I just think if I were uh, studying at this point or if I were researching or an academic, Pacific Alliance would be one of the most interesting things to look at because it is, it, it really is a fascinating development as, as a, you know, as a movement, if you will, you know, really organically coming out of the region. Um, all of the diplomats that I talked to, and others may know more about those who were negotiating it, but all of the diplomats I talked to, and Antonio and others may have been part of that, were like physically exhausted every time I saw them because these presidents were literally meeting with each other at presidential level like once a month, right, during the first year. And they did a couple of those summits virtually. It, it was remarkable what they got done. And I also thought it was remarkable because I was with Secretary Clinton in one of the early meetings that she had with Pacific Alliance foreign ministers. and. It was a great conversation, and I remember somebody saying to us before we sat down in that meeting, why are you doing this? Like, what, what, what possible conversation could you have with these folks? And it was early on, and what, what the foreign minister said to her, because it also happened to be four foreign ministers with whom we have the best relationships in the hemisphere, leaving aside Canada for the moment, okay? Um, and so it was a really good conversation because we have a very open com, you know, kind of conversation, frank conversation. And one of the messages was, because this was early in the process, one of the messages was we were very interested in it. We thought it was very um, important, had real potential. And one of the messages was, do us a favor, stay away for a while. Right? Don't, don't love us too much. And don't ask to be part of it. And, and we said, we get it. We totally get it. We will, we will back off and maybe not even be as enthusiastic in public as we sometimes would be, because that can be the kiss of death. Um, and, and so a year later, right, when this had moved forward so successfully, and we went back and asked about observership, we were like, you know, 15th in line. Right? And we ended up becoming observers at the same time as China, 
Um, and people started saying to us, what the hell are you waiting for? <laughs> but in fact, it was, I think, very smart. Um, even today, there are people who argue, wrongly, of course, that you know, Pacific Alliance is a creature of the United States, which is absurd. Pacific Alliance is incredibly smart, policy-wise, and aggressive, and clearly moving ahead of where the United States can move in some areas. Um, and so I think it's one of the most interesting experiments we've seen in the region. Um, TPP is moving towards the finish line, and I think it's very important, and I think my job has been from the beginning to stand on the sideline and go, over here, it's not just Asia, um, because there is sometimes a forgetfulness that TPP includes you know, five Western Hemisphere countries, um, and it's very important to us in the Western Hemisphere. Um, it, it will be important for others in the Western Hemisphere to be part of TPP. It's already obviously something that, you know, there are multiple countries in the Western Hemisphere that want to be part of TPP, but we need to get to the end of, of TPP with the countries who are in the initial conversation. That is, we need to, we need to close out this round of negotiations that, and come up with the TPP first before we talk about Colombia or Panama or, or others. Um, but I think that's obviously where everyone would like it to head. Um, there are logical questions, for example, about why TTIP did not begin with North America. Um, I think those are logical questions. I think it was not possible at the very beginning. But I think equally, the, the, the inescapable logic of North America European free trade will out, so that that will be where that goes as well, one hopes, especially because Mexico has a free trade agreement with the EU and Canada as well. So I think then you turn to the others, right? Then you turn to Mercosur, which is just struggling to remain relevant in a trade sense while Uruguay and Paraguay kind of chafe at even being part of it and become observers to everything else they can so that they can line up to be ready because they can't leave. Poor Paraguay just got back in to some of these organizations. <laughs> but, but they really are bound by it and would like to be part of some of those movements. And ultimately, you know, we have to see what the Brazilian elections bring. Um, and what happens in Argentina over the next 12 months. But, but that change, I think, will come too. You know, it's interesting also on the other groups that are non-trade based, uh, you know, uh, CELAC, ALBA. CELAC is an interesting organization and people kept asking us whether we were threatened by it. I I'm not sure I see it as relevant as it once was. Um, UNASUR has now attempted to broker two resolutions of democracy crises, right? One in Paraguay, one in Venezuela. They have failed twice. And in the second one, we gave them a huge wide berth and enthusiastically supported it because it was clear that the OAS was not going to be allowed to broker a solution. In Paraguay, they, they, they went about it all wrong. And the OAS, frankly, picked up the pieces and did a good job. But in Venezuela, it, it, we hoped they would succeed. Unfortunately, no one has succeeded in trying to broker a, a, either a resolution on the political side or some movement on the economic side. So, so I, I, you know, I, I think everybody's struggling with relevance right now, except you know, those who are moving ahead in the modern world, like the Pacific Alliance, TPP, those groupings. And NAFTA. Well, and NAFTA, indeed. Um, unfortunately, um, yeah, we're going I'm to taking have up to, the other panels. Um, um, we're so we're going to have to uh, have to wrap up right now. Roberta, thank you so much for sharing your um, thoughts you with us and for being here this morning.